Fans of a Horus Heresy, Masterworks of the Omnisire, and Sonic Weaponry Writ Large. Thank you very much for joining me for a model, build, and tactics and rules review of this magnificent machine. And this is the Mechanicum Ordinatus Minoris Ulator. And this is a full resin model from Forge World's range for the Horus Heresy Age of Darkness game. And what a massive model this is, as we can see. This is a super heavy Lords of War category vehicle. And what I'm going to do in today's review is I'm going to talk to you about this model and its purpose in game, Horus Heresy, the Age of Darkness. So what we're going to do today is have a look at all things Ulator. I'm going to show you around this magnificent full resin kit. I'm going to have a look at the details of features. I'm then going to talk to you a bit about the kit itself, the build experience and the quality of a product and share some thoughts around that. We're then going to do some size comparisons against other models from the Age of Darkness range from Forge World. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about using this monster vehicle in Age of Darkness war games. So that's the plan. Right, well, let's start at the beginning and we will have a look around this model. This, as you can probably see from the Mark 1 cheese hands, is a big, big model. And if we turn it around, we can just sort of get a feel for its look and dimensions. This is quite a tricky model to uh, show off because as you've probably already noticed, it has this articulating universal joint or this ball joint, I should really say, that connects the front and the rear elements of the vehicle together. And we'll talk about more on that later. So general design features. Well, it's quite an intriguing premise. Essentially it is four large caterpillar tread units articulated in the middle so you've got a front set and then a rear set and then the rear set has got this large platform on it and onto that is mounted the sonic destructor which is the main weapon of this huge super heavy and yeah we can see how colossal this is as you would expect from a full resin forge wall kit the detail level is exceptional there's so much going on with this model. Beautifully detailed, very interesting design, absolutely fascinating design. And as well as a domain weapon, the Sonic Destructor, it also has what you might call a control console here at the back or a control bay. And there's a couple of Mechanicum Servitor type things or perhaps gunnery control, a Volkite Culverin Servitor, giving some rear point defense. That point defense is augmented as well at the front end by a pair of sponsor mounted Volkite Culverins on the front tractor units. So that is the general layout of the model. So it's a big thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to break it up into some smaller chunks to get a feel for it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to separate front and back. Now, because of how long a thin this is, I made a decision that I was going to make it in magnetized. So I've magnetized the ball joint like so. So that looks nice and easily. Two advantages here. One, I could have put a long steel rod all the way through, but I think this is a bit easier to transport. And it also allows me to, you know, articulate that. And it's a nice feature on this particular design that it's been made that way. And it was clearly designed to be able to articulate. We'll start up front and see what's there. So here we have the front track assembly. So I'll just move that one into the background a bit more. So two large tracks. We've got this sort of multi-link suspension arrangement there. It's lovely detailing. Here we've got a very distinctive piece of equipment to this vehicle and I think indeed possibly unique to it. This is the dispersion shield and we'll come back to that in the rules. Loads of detail. Fully detailed tracks, fully detailed both underneath and on top. We've got all this connected pipe working and perhaps a transmission system, you know, driving from the reactor to the front wheels and the shielding system. There's Volkite culverins, very distinctive design. These are uh, elevate and rotate, so you can assemble them, so they'll do that. But I do like it. It kind of looks a bit like something that can, despite its size, can actually move quite quick when it needs to. I think this sort of suspension arrangement and these big tracks and the fact that they look like they're perhaps built for speed add something to that. And we'll see that when we make, compare it to a model later on a bit more. There's full interior detailing on the inside of tracks. And I'm just going to remove this piece here and then we can see that in more detail. So that's really nice. 
and the, that is duplicated on both sides and the inside of track housing that's fully detailed as well as you can see i've not stuck this yet i've left it like that because uh, it hinges here i've left it this way basically uh, to help the paint when they come to do this so that is the front track assembly now if we go and grab the rear which is much larger and more substantial we're going to need to break this down so what i'm going to do first is i'm going to remove the sighting telescope which is uh, magnetized and moves and we'll uh, talk a bit more about that in a bit and then i'm also going to remove the sonic destructor itself and we'll set that to one side and we'll take a look at the actual unit itself so yeah big hefty thing these massive big track units again they're styled in the same way as the front track units you've got the umbilical here that connects to the front via the ball joint there is a notch so it does go a particular way for lining that up again detailed on the inside and out the mounting pylon for the telescope we've got this little rotating wheel here and then a real feast of detail at the back here with these control panels the gun servitor which i'm not yet stuck on that's just a push for it but a better look and there's all sorts of sighting apparatus and levers and you can see that the servo gunners are reaching various levers and whatnot to pull and operate there and there's a look at our little gunner we'll call him samson it's perhaps got the worst job in the whole mechanicum or maybe it's got the best because it's just got this gun and it gets to shoot it all day who knows again those detach the outer track units well they come separate i've again left them off to aid the painter with doing the interior detailing here in terms of detailing yeah i would say for an underside of a model it's very nicely detailed as well so good job as you know, is often the case with forge wall kits. The detail is 360. It's fully detailed in every direction and from every perspective. So yeah, very nice. And the, you can see how the rear track units are bigger and heftier than the front ones, which suggests obviously that the bearing additional weight. Another thing that I just didn't comment on there was here's a mounting point for the main gun. It's not designed to rotate. I think it's supposed to be fixed forward firing. It can elevate in terms of how the design has been laid out. However, the model parts don't elevate by default. So you would have to do some quite hefty converting work if you wanted to create that functionality, but it's not impossible. Now let's take a look at the actual Sonic Destructor itself and what a huge gun this is and an amazingly detailed piece of gear. I mean, just look at it and it's just all these dishes and arrays and fins and pylons and if you were to ever have something that could be described as being peak Mechanicum, I think this gun is it. And you've got as well as all the emitter array at the front and the dishes which are perhaps focusing and then the main array which is very nicely detailed as you can see there's then a series of what are presumably capacitor banks for charging up power from the reactor that's mounted in there and then some enormous perhaps power converter system and all sorts of gubbins that bit of detail I've just left off for ease of painting but yeah as you can see beautifully detailed throughout really really exceptional model on the detail front as you would expect from a super heavy model from forge World. these are the mounting pistons and as you can see they're kind of moving i've not stuck those yet obviously for reason of leaving this off for painting and also for demonstration purposes i put pin through these to articulate them and just hold them in place at the moment you could if you're very keen drill these out and create extending pistons and i think you could do that for and back and that could then allow you to have the gun raise up and down because this joint here can rotate up and down although i've stuck it in my example i had to think about articulating the gun but ultimately i thought you know it's probably going to be more trouble than it's worth and also i wasn't sure about the final balance because it's quite front heavy i thought yeah it's going to have a tendency to slump forward so i was a little bit reluctant to do that as well because of that just to jump forward a bit on size comparisons just to give you an idea of how big this is so this is sort of like in the same size category almost as a main battle weapon for warlord titan so here we have a warlord titan's sun fury plasma annihilator and this is almost about as big as guns get in 40k and 30k tabletop scale and if i can just squeeze everything in camera 
just about. You can see the size. I mean, it's not quite as big, but it's definitely in the ballpark. A Warlord Titan probably wouldn't look out of scale with this, and certainly a Reaver or a Warbringer Titan, it will go fine on. This on top of the Warbringer Titan could be very interesting. So yeah, there's just a bit of a perspective on the size of this thing. Finishing off in terms of just looking at the detail, we have this, and this is the targeting telescope. And again, the detail is absolutely superb. All over. Yeah, no effort was spared when they designed this. Beautifully done, really, really cool. In terms of a design and the look of a thing, I think it's incredible. I'm not sure who designed this. I think it's probably one of Stuart Williamson's designs as he did most of the mechanic and vehicles. Like the Ordinatus Acteus I reviewed a few months ago. I think it's fantastic they ever made it. And that's why I kind of bought it as well because you never know with Forge all the things are gonna go out of stock. And if this goes, who knows if we'll ever see the likes of this model ever again. But absolutely fantastic. Okay, so. That's a quick view around the model. While it's still dismantled, let's now move into a talk about the kit and the build process before we move into size comparisons while it's all broken down because that will help us here. Now, there's a couple of little breakouts where past leaky cheese are gonna make an appearance to talk about things. But starting with high level observations. Now, this is a big forge old model, uh, UK price at the moment. So this uh, December 23, the price on this model, I think is 375 pounds. So it's an expensive kit. It's about the same price as a Mastodon for the Legion. It's a big one. And with any big forge old kit at that size, it is a challenging thing to build. This is a expert kit. Now on their website, they now put, you know, expert 15 plus and I think they mean age 15 plus, but I would actually say 15 plus years of experience might be a better way of imagining it. You know, you need to be confident with working with resin, heating resin parts up to take out warps and dealing with alignment and fit issues if you're going to take on something like this. That said, however, for a big forge wall kit, I actually really enjoyed building this one and it was probably one of the easier large super heavy forge or models to build if not the easiest that's not to say it is easy but it is one of the easier ones and if you were thinking of a model to pick to get into this scale of model this wouldn't be a bad place to start and i would certainly recommend this ahead of the acteus or the mastodon or perhaps the glaive or fell blade tanks which are quite tricky so that said however a couple of just observations in terms of how i built it and what i did so pinning oh so many pins right can i talk about all the pins let's try go through all the pins first i'll go through and talk about each bin sequence so there is a pin that goes through the dispersion sealed into this section here for strength that's a two millimeter steel pin so a piano wire pin there's a pin that runs through here on these axle pieces for strength. Although that will be eventually stuck, I still put that on for extra strength. And when I come to stick this finally, I'm gonna put the glue on there and then obviously attach this point here. So that doesn't really lend. This bit here is too thin to put a pin in. So that's why I reinforced this hinge section. Two mil steel pin extends into here. There's a pin that runs through here. That's like just a half millimeter steel pin to hold that in place. Also a couple of pins. You can see the base of here. And here on the suspension rigs or suspension coils, which hold those in place. I just then stuck inside of that because they've got really snug and firm attachment points. These two bits aren't pinned. Um, they got a really nice socket attachment points. So I just stuck those on. And I think that was it for pinning, really. I mean, it's quite a lot of pins still, nonetheless. I put a pin in these here you know, just for strength as well. That's the side. Might have more to make it than move as well. So a fair few pins. And then another, the other, I guess, building bit is there's a magnet there. And I think that's six by three millimeters. I just forget now. But it's basically the biggest magnet I could counter drill into the mountain lug for the universal joint. You can see it's contemporary there. Oh, so many more pins. Right. There's another pin that runs into here. Again, that's a two mil steel pin and that extends into the ball. So that goes all the way through there. And that is because obviously this potentially could have quite a lot of force on it. And I just, I always over engineer my builds to make sure they don't break. There's nothing worse than a resin model breaking because it all fails spectacularly if it's a big structural bit. So there's a pin there. And as I said, you've got the magnets there. Careful gluing with this array not to glue that if you want it to move. More pins. So there's two pins in the 
in the mount for the telescope. Where else? I think I put pins in here and here and there and there to hold this all together. Now, one thing that is a bit of a weak spot or potential weak spot are the mounts for these track units here. And I had to think about this. And in the end, I opted to put these pins in like that because they just sort of sit into those cups, which isn't the strongest attachment point. So I wanted to make it as strong as I could. I think once it's super glued in place with the pin, I think it will be strong enough, but I was a bit reluctant just to leave it to the cups and posts alone or pegs alone. So I did that as well. Yeah, a lot of pins as well as the magnet here to line up with in there i also did a bit of work to magnetize well not magnetize but articulate the telescope because i noticed that it had this rotating cog that was supposed to be running off this drive here and then on this cog so i made a washer out of plastic card or plastic card there that's why i put one mil pin on that and did a very tight hole so it won't come out and this will hold it in place and then there's a magnet there and a magnet in there and then that clicks into there like that and that allows the telescope array to articulate pretty neat and it goes about there because this pipe gets in the way bit of a design whoops there. i think they could have done with maybe a slightly shorter pipe or going somewhere else it doesn't get in the way but uh i think when you actually realistically imagine how this gun will be aimed i.e you can't really shoot it at air targets or particularly high i think the range of motion fits probably okay with that just cut to a bit of past cheese having a look at how all that fits together on the pin Given the long thin nature of this piece and how it's going to bear a lot of weight, what I did was I put a pin all the way through. So I've got the three, well, four constituent parts. I've stuck the dispersion shield generator onto this like, chassis block and there's these two parts. And I just put a two mil hole all the way through, which takes a pin like so. Nice and strong, and once glued together, there's no way it will break. So there you can see how I did the detail of that. Now let's take a look at Sonic Destructor. So this was the one place where I had some problems with the actual fit of this, and that was around the actual gun array itself. And you can see that there's some filling and plastic art there. And basically this piece had come out of the mold distorted. And I almost asked for a replacement, but I thought I'd give it a go to put some spaces in to realign it. And I was pretty pleased with where I got in the end. So that was all right. Now, there's a big old steel two mil piano wire pin running all the way along there. One, two, three, four, five, six pieces, and then the seventh, the body. So that's all pinned, one continuous pin. So you need to be careful. I got a special long, two millimeter drill to do that. These are just glued in place. I got quite a strong attachment point, so I didn't think they needed a pin. But yeah, I think the one bit was just rebuilding this bit so it was properly aligned. And I needed to work to be carefully test for a lot around this to make sure everything lined up properly. Other pins, there's another couple of pins holding these in place, these big tubes on the outside. I think I put those here. There's another pin holding this rear assembly onto the body you know you can never be too strong as far as i'm concerned and then there's a pin running through that to hold that and then there's another small pin that holds that in place as well so quite a few pins as you might imagine as is always the case you don't want it to break now let's cut to pass me and i'll just give you a little demo of how all the parts of that actually assemble together another piece of structural reinforcement work that i've done on the ordinatus is around the Sonic Destructor, so obviously the main party piece of this vehicle. And here, there's a whole series of components that makes up the front end of this gun. And allow me to introduce these. That's kind of like the uh, power element, we could say. And then there's this piece here, so that's one. There's this second piece here, two. A third piece here, fourth, fifth, and sixth and they all sort of stack together. Now they're quite nicely designed in terms of interfacing. So we've got some nice notches that lock into one another in sequence to make a nice strong fit. But nonetheless, I decided to put a two millimeter steel pin all the way through for strength. And you can see how this has been done here. I had a issue with this in terms of the casting and this was a irrecoverable one. And essentially this piece was distorted in the mold. And what that meant is when I came to put this bit on, 
there was a big gap because this side was cast lower than this piece. In other words, it wasn't square. So my fix for that was to build this plastic card collar. And that will go like that. There's a little bit of misalignment at the moment. I've got a little bit more drilling to do just to get it perfectly aligned, but it will do. And you can see if I hold it, how that is now lining up. So once that's super glued in place and a bit of filler, that'll be all good to go. That makes sure that there's no chance of the Sonic Destructor ever falling apart or getting broken. So it is quite a long thing and you never know if it takes a whack what might happen. So yes, one Sonic Destructor Avec Rod Stiel for strength. Okay, now you can see how I did the pinning work on that. And you may also get a bit of a feel for the offset there before I'd done the filling with Milliput and the plastic card spaces to finally get it perfect. So really interesting build, a fascinating model design. It's well designed, a couple of production issues in, you know, in terms of that piece, but overall a fairly straightforward kit to build in terms of a design and the layout. Production quality, I did have a number of issues on production quality and i'll split these into two halves so the first was around the these rear track units well all the track units the inners and the outers were a bit bent as is commonly the case with four drill they take these things out of the mold before they're fully cooled down and they're still a bit soft and they bend so i had to take warps out of all the track units in particular but you know as you can see that was successful you know, they're nice and straight now. Camera barrel distortion aside. What wasn't as easy to fix was the mismatch in fit between the outer and the inner. And this required quite a lot of work. So basically the space between here, here, and here, that didn't fit inside here. So I had to do a lot of careful filing work to size these down so they would fit into this. And that did take quite a lot of time and work to get right. And then I even took some material off the top. So I suspect that may well be an issue that is common to all these kits. So the way I approach that is I took the warps out first. So I got the individual components straight and then I worked on getting them to fit. So that sizing issue affected, it was just the rear ones. The front ones were fine. They fit really well. So it's just the rear two where I had to do that work on the inside track element. The only other issue with the kit was, which was actually affected a lot of parts, was the 3D master prints um, hadn't been fully cleaned up. So what do I mean by that? So when you, all these models are made via a 3D printer. Yeah, so the masters and printed on the 3D printer. Depending on the quality of a printer, and obviously when Games Workshop did these, they didn't have as good a printer as you can get now. And there were some layering artifacts. And if you had a 3D model, you know what I'm on about. And there are a number of these on various parts of the model. So I had to spend a lot of time removing those artifacts. And I'll put some photos up as I'm talking now, just to sort of show you examples, because I took lots of photos as I was working through. Now, do you have to take these off? Of course you don't, you know, if you're happy to leave them there, you know, that's fine. Do just be mindful though, if you're gonna paint it and then apply washers and then dry brush, 3D print artifacts will get picked out by those painting processes. If you're flat airbrushing, it's probably less of an issue. Well, it is less of an issue, but where you got washers and dry brushing, those 3D artifacts are gonna pop. And, you know, as you can see, I had quite a lot on the insides of these. I mean, you might say, well, you don't see that, perhaps you don't, but on a model like this, I want it to look as good as it can. I think. In terms of letdowns on this model, that was my one thing that I thought was a letdown. It was that the original hadn't been as well finished on the cleanup of the 3D print master as it could have been. But yeah, so something to bear in mind there and watch out for. Or something to consider if you are thinking of buying one of these. But overall, as I say, if you are interested in a super heavy vehicle from Forge World and don't want to have to deal with some of the nonsense of trying to get warps out on models like the Legion Mastodon, which is difficult and deal with the internal bulkheads that don't fit properly, or the just general amazing challenge that is the Acteus, then you know this model has a lot going for it. It is a fun build and I really enjoyed building it, setting aside the having to do that 3D print artifact removal. Those are some thoughts on the actual build process. And as is often the case with these four-draw models, when I have a tough time building one, the end result is worthy of the effort. It does look incredible. And where else do you get models that look like this? Well, you pretty much don't. They are in a bit of a league of their own. Very impressive model. And I'm absolutely delighted with it. 
So, um, what else do I want to talk about before we move on to size comparisons? So actually, let's do size comparisons now. So, got a few of the larger Mechanicum units I like to compare this to, as it seems right to compare them to the stalemates, and I should probably get a Space Marine as well. So, let's start with Space Marines. Firstly, we've got a regular Astartes. Well, if this guy could ever be described as being a regular Astartes, this is Varen Asheridon. Leader of the True Sons of the Sons of Horus, a recent character model in a very nice Mark III plate. Mm, yeah, that is the magnitude of this model. It's enormous. And if we put one of his Terminator Elite against him, this Justarian here, it is absolutely huge. It's a super heavy and it's in a league of its own. There's not many vehicles that was the size of this. You've got this, the Actaeus, and then the Mastodon, probably. And even the Mastodon's not really as big as this footprint rise. Let's go for something big from the Mechanicum stable. Here we have a, an old channel favourite. And now a, a model that's finally reached its potential in terms of the gaming capabilities. This is the Thanatar Calyx Battle Automata, or Automata, Tomata. Awesome model. This is like a heavy robot, the Mechanicum. And if we stand that alongside the Ulator, we can see its colossal size. Even this thing, which is a big robot, and if we bring Varen back in, you can see how the Calyx dwarfs him, and the Calyx still looks small next to the Ulator. Absolutely colossal. Yeah, a beast. So let's move up to something vehicular. And here we've got our friend, the Krios Battle Tank. So the first of the Mechanicum vehicles to come out. Its tracks are only the same size as the front track units. The small track units on the other tour. It's huge, isn't it? It's a monster. Okay, let's step it up now in terms of Mechanicum vehicle sizes to something that is generally seen as being a big vehicle, the Triaros Armoured Conveyor. You know, the land trireme of the Mechanicum. An absolutely incredible vehicle. Yeah. I love this. It's bigger. It still looks pretty small. <laughs> to get something that matches it size-wise, we're going to have to step it up another notch. And there's only one real vehicle that will give us a comparison here, and that is none other than this Leviathan, the Ornatus Acteus. And let's do a little bit of manoeuvring to get the two on and in camera. So finally, in its subterranean stable mate, we found something that is of a similar size to the Ulator. You can see how tiny it is compared to these behemoths. Size-wise, compared to the Acteus, it's comparable. It's a little bit, it's probably just a touch longer. The Ulator is actually wider. And I quite like how the tracks on the Ulator look like the bigger, wider spaced, more for maneuvering, whereas this thing is more about a big, heavy, transports are moving the weight around but the mass on this one is very hefty and got a massive body compared to this interesting to compare these two leviathans land leviathans and mechanicum together so there you go some size comparisons so before we move into the rules section, I just want to touch on thematic backgrounds because the basic idea of this thing is a fusion reactor on tracks with a huge energy shield and a massive sonic cannon. Now sonic weaponry is quite unusual and I was trying to think of ideas or sci-fi tropes that the designers may have pulled on and I came up with three which I'll show you in a moment which are possible influences. So the first was the 1980 film Battle Beyond the Stars and in the latter section where the ground assault happens on the planet and the fighting in the tunnels the bad guys bring in their sonic tank and that is literally a tank with a sonic weaponry. Now that's a bit different because it seems to work by affecting people's ears perhaps less physically destructive whereas this is quite physically destructive in the game but it's still the same sort of idea of a sonic weapon tank so that was one that i thought of the second idea was the 1984 film dune based on the book of the same name by frank herbert and in that they took a slightly different creative direction to the novel and they took the idea of a weird in way of warfare that's a bit of a tricky thing to say, in a different direction to being a 
set of fighting techniques to being a sonic weapon system and they had the weirding modules they were sonic weapons weapon that projected sound now those were physically destructive and they came in both sort of what you might call a handgun style type weapon or a two-handed style weapon a an infantry portable one or a larger one uh, which was more sized for destroying vehicles so i thought yeah the wording modules might have been something that the designers were thinking of with the sonic destructor and then the final one and perhaps this is the most direct as a spiritual ancestor was from a derivative piece of dune fiction in the form of the i think it was 1990 or 1991 computer game for virgin interactive dune to the battle for arrakis and one of the faction specific units was the atreides sonic tank now i remember playing this when it came out and the atreides sonic tank fired a wall of sound or like a sound wave and it did huge amounts of damage to enemy units in its path and it passed through and over any number of enemy units until it reached its maximum range where it stopped so you could hit multiple units on the way and you, we've got one of these on screen at the moment and it had this big sort of dish so it didn't have this sort of long barrel like array but it did have the dish however the way the weapon works a wall of sound being super destructive i do think could have been a direct influence on i presume it was alan Bly who wrote the original rules to this so yeah i thought i'd share those few ideas about sonic weapons in science fiction uh, because i'm not really something we have today if, unless you count flashbang grenades sonic weapons are not really a current thing but they have featured in some sci-fi i would be also interested here if any of you have ideas on other sci-fi sonic weapons that could perhaps have been an influence on the design of this or even if they you know have come post 2016 or so when the rules for this came out other examples interesting to know what how these things are appearing in sci-fi and that little bit of discussion around sonic weapons in sci-fi nicely brings us on to a quick look at the rules and the main thing I want to talk about in the rules is the weapon itself, a Sonic Destructor. But let's just touch on the stats for this tank. These stats come from the book Liber Mechanicum, which was published in 2022. And I'll put some rules on screen now. So let's have a quick look at the stats. So move is 10, ballistic skill 4, armor front 14, side 13, rear 13, hull points is 14. So the unit type is a super heavy vehicle. Its war gear is one front hull mounted Sonic Destructor, a rear mounted Volkite Culverin, two sponsor mounted volkite culverins and an ordinatus dispersion shield and it also has a special rules it will not die six plus reactor meltdown major and reinforced structure and the points cost is 1075 so 1075 puts it somewhere between a warhound titan and a Reva Titan in cost. Yeah, to use this in a game, you need a 4,000 point game or a bit over 4,000 points. So it's for big engagements. And when we get into the rules, you'll see why. So as you can see, it's a heavily armored vehicle, not as heavily armored as Marine stuff, but still pretty heavily armored. 14 hull points is a lot. It will not die six plus, means it can put hit points back on. Reinforced structure gives it a native five plus invulnerable save against all damage, unless that damage can ignore a vulnerable save. So it's pretty tough. So even if you're hitting it with destroyer weapons, you'll still be able to take an invulnerable save against that but still 14 hull points on a big target like this may not last that long so you probably want to protect it with flanking units to draw fire and also protect against deep strikes and flanking attacks but that's not what, what's really interesting about it it's a weapons weapon wise we've got three volkite culverins this is super heavy so they can fire independently range 45 five shots at strength six ap5 with death great it's good firepower and um, not to be smirked at and it's got one on each front side and then it's got samson at the back there so it's quite well equipped with point defense and it needs it i would think because when we look at the sonic destructor your opponent is going to want to get rid of this thing quick sharp because it's gonna do a lot of damage now sonic destructor this is arguably the most powerful weapon in the game certainly against armored targets and it's no slouch against infantry either so range 72 strength 6 ap2 doesn't sound much however it is destroyer one it's got large blast five sonic wave which is a unique rule to this vehicle pinning armor bane ranged murderous strike five plus and ignores cover right so the base stat line on this isn't much strength six ap2 
However, it's the special rules and how they interact together that make it so deadly. Let's approach this from the perspective of infantry targets first. So infantry targets also include robots, automata, and dreadnoughts, yeah. So strength six, so-so. However, that's powerful against Marines, and AP2 is also powerful. So Terminators are on their invun save, standard Marines no save. Ignores cover means no one's getting a saving throw against this unless you have a native invulnerable save. Before I go into the actual damaging bit, let's just deal with how Sonic Wave works. So Sonic Wave is a very rare attack in the game in that it's a blast weapon, so it's a five inch diameter large blast template, and you can place it, you can choose your target, and you don't have to roll to hit once. So that ballistic skill four only matters for the Volkites, yeah? So what you do is you put your large blast template in front of this, and then you just literally, you pick an endpoint and you then pass that blast template all the way along that line up to 72 inches. Any unit that gets touched, so any model that gets touched takes a hit. So if you think about this, you can hit an insanely huge number of units with this vehicle's weapon, with the Sonic Destructor, and it's automatic hit, so you don't roll to hit, you ignore cover. It's absolutely lethal in terms of actually hitting stuff. When it comes to damage, you'll find out, we'll see in a moment, just how severe it is. So, Strength 6 AP2, so two to win standard Marines, no armor saves. Merger Strike on a five plus gives it instant death. If you say score 10 hits on a squad of Marines, you know, three or four of those will be Merger Strike hits where you can't take a feel no pain roll against and terminate will be killed if they fail their armor saves and armor bane ranged gives it some bite versus dreadnoughts as well so armor bane ranged means that against dreadnoughts and automata you can re-roll failed to wound rolls so that's strength six which is a little bit weak versus a contempt with toughness seven still means that you're going to be getting a 50 50 chance of wounding and if you make that well, slightly better than 50 50 chance and if you make that wound it's going to be d3 wounds because the murderous strike will happen automatically and they'll be on their atomantic shield save only. You can hurt Dreadnoughts quite a lot with this, despite those initially weak looking stats. Pinning, obviously going back to your infantry, there's a very high chance you're going to take casualties from this, so you will need to take pinning checks, so you can cause a lot of debuffs in effect through that, but arguably the weapon is at its most lethal when fired against vehicles. Now here a number of rules work together. It's Destroyer 1, so what Destroyer 1 means is when you roll to penetrate armour, you roll an extra dice, so normally two, and then you discard the lowest. So strength six, roll three dice, discard the lowest to keep the highest two. That's pretty good. However, it's better than that because it has armor bane ranged, which gives it an extra D6. So whenever you roll to penetrate armor, you're throwing four D6 and discarding the lowest. So you keep the highest three. So against a normal vehicle, its maximum armor penetration is three times six, which is 18 plus six, which is 24. The toughest armored vehicle in the game with a flare shield is 16. And this thing can beat armor 24. And because of discard and the lowest it's skewed higher so the hitting power on this versus vehicles is absolutely terrifying ap2 as well so any penetrating hits um you're getting that bonus on the damage table but the weapon is at its most devastating against super heavies knights or titans in that instance if they get touched by that template and it still passes through them to hit more targets beyond the weapon strength increases to 10 yeah so at that point, your armor penetration roll is 4d6, discarding the lowest, plus 10, which means you can max out at 28 points of armor penetration. Now, even against a Warlord Titan or a Warbringer on the front with their 15 points of armor, you are going to be smashing through that armor easily with this. And that is why the Ordinatus Acteus has got such a powerful gun. And as I say, versus vehicles, I think it's most powerful hard-hitting gun in the game. Hard-hitting, yeah? Even harder-hitting than a bellicose volcano cannon, and that is saying something. So this is an incredible weapon. Take a bit of tactical finesse to make the most of it, and, you know, hit as many things as you can with that five-inch template, but wow, what a gun. And I feel that on this I just decided you know what we are going to make it sound as deadly as it was in the audio dramas where this was first mentioned of course that was the Endred Har trilogy of the false war which had a trio of these things being demonstrated by one of the Zahn and Techno Magi two of which was stolen by Endred Har and his Black Shields yeah if you're not listening to that listen to it and then the weapon stats on this it'll make sense why they're so good absolutely fascinating in-game unit the one thing I've not mentioned yet is the dispersion shield so this basically works for the first turn it affects the side and the front arc 
any shots coming at it is minus two strengths outside of destroyer weapons or armor bane melter rules or armor bane range weapons it's pretty much invulnerable to fire on turn one and that feels like it's been written like the appearance of one of these type devices in the novel Mechanicum by Graham McNeil another good book and if you read that you'll understand what the idea of a dispersion shield is that's a really powerful defense on turn one obviously you can't get behind it because you can't deep strike on turn one but it only lasts one turn and after that you're on your armor which is 14 and 13 and that native 5 plus reinforced structure save so you're going to want to protect this with flanking units guards and you would probably also be well advised to have a battlesmith nearby who can repair damage that would also make sense to me anyway so yeah there's a few thoughts on the rules for using this in game i think they're incredibly flavoursome rules absolutely bonkers as you might expect from a vehicle that looks like this clearly something for big special games you could perhaps do it on a small table but you'll probably find it would annihilate enemy armies just by on account of how tough it is and the absurd firepower of a sonic destructor maybe an interesting game an interesting game would be to do a bunch of black shields in a mastodon trying to overpower the crew on one and recreate that scene from the false war as I described earlier that might be an interesting game so i think that's everything that i want to say on the mechanicum ordinatus from forge world it's an incredible vehicle an incredible kit if you want to build a super heavy from forge world and you're a little bit intimidated by some of the more notorious kits this is worth considering it is one of the easier builds for this size as a gaming unit it's absolutely bonkers and it's probably going to be a huge amount of fun in the right sort of game where everybody knows it's going to be part of the game and you don't turn up and that guy someone with it and what an incredible centerpiece of the collection i do wonder perhaps you know will we see the likes of a new model like this again i'm not sure so yeah i'm glad i've got one while there was opportunity to do so anyway so that's been a very long video there was so much to cover on this i do hope you've enjoyed listening though and found all the observations and ideas that i've shared of interest to you as always please do share your own thoughts and ideas in the comment section i'll be interested to read those as it's a seasonal time of year i'd just like to wish you all a happy festive holiday or christmas if you're celebrating it do enjoy that have a good break over the christmas period and other than that thank you very much for watching I'll speak to you next time, and goodbye.